Good morning, everyone. Hi. I, I'll try not to hide over here, but to move over here for a bit. This was not made for non-Swedish people. Um, we're going to have a nice panel today uh, applying SAT to different domain and different theoretical concepts. We're going to have three talks, uh, all by members of the PADS project in Cambridge. My name is Gali Perry. I'm from the PADS project in Cambridge and from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And I'm going to be presenting this. We'll have two talks after that, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to apply today the theoretical framework of situational action theory to political extremism, which might seem a bit tricky to begin with. So actually, when I approach this problem, um, it seems like the propensity of political violence is kind of the end product of a whole radicalization process. At least this is how it's described in the literature. And this uh, um, end product of the radicalization process is combining two things. So extremist ideology on the one hand and a violent tendency on the other. This is actually what permits it to become uh, a risk for political violence. And this propensity is the result of an interaction, as described in SAT, um, between a personal cognitive vulnerability to this kind of extremist behavior, uh, which is composed by the morality and the self-control, and exposure to radical settings, very much like we know about crime. And there's much empirical findings that support this idea of exposure to radical settings as being an essential component of the process. However, when we speak about the role of morality and self-control within this process of radicalization, there's much less literature. So we know less about the role they play in someone radicalizing into propensity for political violence. So I'm going to speak a bit about political violence propensity, what it means, and the process of radicalization that might lead you there, and then present the study uh, that was done on the case study of far-right extremism within the past um, uh, group, and the finding and some very, very preliminary thoughts. So situational action theory, as you, I'm guessing you already know, uh, suggests that people develop individual criminal propensities by integrating what is considered to be individual characteristics or an, an environmental level factors. And crime and political violence are very similar this way, and this is very present, especially in the writing of Buhana and Wickstrom from the last few years. So political violence propensity, following the same logic, would be the perception of political violence as an alternative action. That means I would perceive political violence as one of my options when in choosing my actions. And that would be the end result, as I said, of a radicalization process. So this would be the process through which an individual acquires this kind of radical belief that terrorism or political violence are alternative behaviors. Um, you should combine for that a set of ideas, so a radical set of beliefs or an ideology, an extremist one, that would allow you to perceive this as an alternative action, but also a tendency towards violence, Otherwise, this remains as a set of ideas and does not turn into propensity of actual political violence. So we know a lot about exposure to radical settings and the role that plays in this interaction between a person and the setting building up towards this propensity. We know that social interaction in closed groups and especially in small groups is very much responsible for this kind of radical set of ideas being acquired. This has been named different names in the literature. So people have been talking about more disengagement or ideological cultivation, but they all describe the same social process when someone is integrated within a small group and then becomes radicalized and embraces these kind of ideas and changes his ideas to be extremist ideas. Khan has looked into political violence in 2004, have discovered he actually described as, as the outcome of a problematic life situation. So someone spending a lot of time with peers with similar radical ideas as opposed to less time with parents and balancing alternative uh, groups. We know a lot less about the role of personal cognitive vulnerability within this process of radicalization. Um, there's very much, there's a lot of stats to suggest 
that some individuals would be more vulnerable to this kind of exposure to radical settings than others. But it's still very unclear what makes one person very exposed to this kind of ideology and another completely immune. Um, if we look at, at what Brickstrom and Triber have published in 2015, a person's low relevant mores and self-control might play an important role in the propensity of political violence, and, violence as well. And it's very highlighted when you look at political violence case studies. That means when you analyze, and that's usually what we do in political violence, you take a case of an action that has already happened, and you go back retrospectively analyzing the attacker and his personality, there you can find that that has been done traits of personality that are linked to morality or linked to self-control. But this is a part of a long line of markers that have been analyzed when we look at case studies. The other problem with that is that we're starting from the end, so we have no point of reference to the other, what we can refer to as the normal or the baseline uh, population. We're just looking at the end product of political violence going from there and analyzing it. So we have no idea from morality of self-control are actually the factors that are involved in this process and might differentiate between those who go through radicalization and those who don't. Um, low self-control has been widely connected to many sorts of crimes, substance abuse and violence. Uh, however, this link to political violence has not completely been done. When we look for help at other uh, domains, we can see that political science offers us a political socialization theory that talks about the same concept, basically. So you've got this process of political socialization, which one goes through uh, as an adolescence. And the political behavior is now learned as a moral development. So again, this concept of morality that is acquired in order to achieve some kind of political behavior. And it, uh, weak morality encourages vulnerability to extreme ideology. So here again, we see that the theory encourages this idea of morality as being a central idea in the process of radicalization. They even go as far as describing what they look at as deviant turn from this normative political socialization process. So one would name this syndrome of right-wing extremism. This would be a deviant term of what is perceived to be a normal acquisition of political ideas. And more rules of the cognitive mechanism are included in extreme, extremist risk assessment, suggesting they will have a role there. But we still, so we have a theoretical background suggesting morality and self-control as key ingredients. We also have some case studies looking back and analyzing them within specific cases of political violence. But we don't really have an empirical examination of this within a normal set of population. And this is a vague attempt <laughs> to describe what I'm going to try to do today. So you can see that on the left, and it's very similar to what you already know about SAD. On the left, you've got the causes of the causes, which in the research of political violence is very often treated as markers. So if, I'm sure you've heard people talk about how more male the females attack, for example. There's more political violence done by men. Uh, political violence is very often uh, linked to deprivation, to many kinds of oppression, um, to, to, to religious and religiosity of many sorts. So these are all alternative explanations or marker or what we talk about as causes of the causes in SAD. Um, on the Next phase, you've got this radicalization process, which combines the exposure to both radical settings on the one hand, to acquire this extremist set of ideas, and to violence as an alternative action on the other hand. And of course, the cognitive vulnerability, so the morality and the self-control, need to be there to allow a person to radicalize through this process. When this process is complete, the end product would be this propensity for political violence. But this doesn't mean that a person will choose this action as a course of action. Not necessarily. You might have the propensity and not go there. And this is the set you actually know and love. So this combination and interaction with the environment would only then allow a person to choose this as a line of action. So I'm only looking today about this cognitive component of the radicalization process. Bear with me while I go through the methodology that all 
I'm learning is about this process. This doesn't mean necessarily that someone would have the end product of an actual moral action of political violence. So my case study would be far-right extremism in the UK, and beside my personal interest in the subject, I think this has proven to be an important issue in Europe in general and in the UK in the last few years. This is a report that was recently published a few months ago by several universities and institutes in Europe, and you can see that 33% of the attacks in Europe between 2000 and 2014 were actually far-right attacks. And not only there are about a third of the attacks, the amount of casualties is very large. So if you look at white green attacks, again, between 2000 and 2014, they caused 260 injuries and 94 fatalities. Not pronouncing this right for sure. And then when you compare that to religious or Islamic-based attacks in Europe, you're only at 16 killed and 65 injured. So while the media and the public discourse is very concentrated in the last few years on specific sort of specific uh, um, area of attacks, of more religious related attacks, we have to remember that in the Western world in general, in the US and in Europe, far right extremist attacks are always there. They're always constant and they cause quite a, a big amount of damage. And I think the um, sample of pads gives us a unique opportunity to look into that. So we rarely go back, I was talking about these case studies, we rarely have the chance to go back and look of how extremism looks within this normative population sample. We usually treat political violence as an inverse problem and start from the end to go to the beginning, um, which gives us, as I said before, no baseline to compare to. This sample of pads allows us to look at youth, normative youth in the UK, and to see which ones would choose this path of extremist ideology, and which ones would combine this with violence, um, and to compare this to other groups within the sample. It's also a good opportunity to look at what we can describe as homegrown extremism, because again, we tend to go to the familiar set of political violence and to look at what is imported political violence most of the time. So um, we base our conclusion of political violence on, on people that were not grown to be extremists within Europe. And that might be a good idea to look on people that were actually raised in Europe and see how this extremist set of ideas was developed within here. I've used wave six of the Petterborough research. There were 19 at the time. I've used the morality and the self-control scale you've seen used yesterday in one of the panels, um, at least one of the panels. Political ideology was measured by declared voting patterns, and we'll, I'll show that in a minute, and violent tendency by their self-testimony and being involved in violence, actual violence, in the last 12 months preceding the survey. And I've done multinominal logistic regression to compare the groups, you'll see that in a minute. So I first wanted to see if there's any correlation between these factors, as they were not examined before. So you can see that there is a relation between self-control and violence, that's not much of a surprise, but there's also a strong relation between morality and self-control and far-right extremism, which guarantees that there's something there. So these are somehow linked. This is what I chose as extremist ideology, and we can discuss this regarding every country in Europe. It's never gonna be perfect, but I think the BNP is, is quite defined as a far-right ideology group within the UK. Um, we have almost 12% voting for this within our sample. And when we look at violence, we got similar percents so of 13% of 19-year-olds involved in violence in the 12 months preceding the sampling. So basically divided the sample, and these are 684 uh, people to four groups. So you can see that the large group, this is almost 80%, had nothing to do neither with extremism nor with violence. So they're not involved in any way. You've got two smaller groups, each about 9%. One was involved in violence and one had extremist far-right ideas. And a very small proportion of our sample, so 3.4, this might remind you of proportions you already know within, about crime, regular crime, are involved with extremism on the one hand and violence on the other. 
Just to give you a quick idea of what this small but important group looks like, it's very uh, coherent with the literature, actually. So you've got more male than female, surprise, surprise, when we talk about political violence. A bit more white than other ethnic groups, which makes sense too. There's not much difference in religion. Um, and these are the four groups I'm analyzing using the regression. When you look at this, you see uh, the comparison between the four groups. So what are my odds of belonging to the more violent group, to the more extremist group, to belonging to this small group that combines extremism with violence? And you can see that weak moral rules and poor self-control actually increases my chances of belonging to each one of these groups. But most importantly, they significantly increase my chances of belonging to the last group, the one at the bottom, the one that combines this set of extremist far-right ideas with a tendency to violence. So we can start talking about a process leading to propensity of political violence. And if you go back here for a minute, you can see the part I was talking about. So if morality and self-control are actually linked to my chances of acquiring this kind of ideology, and of my chances of seeing violence as an alternative action. If I would be then exposed to this kind of radical ideas, if I would be active in the small groups that will allow me to observe this kind of extremism, I might go through this process of radicalization and acquire the propensity for political violence. This again does not mean I'd be engaged in one, so there's much more needed to lead to an action. But it gives you an idea, it gives us a chance to look way back into the process and understand the process of radicalization and see where people start from. So what is required within the personality, within the moral development for me to be vulnerable to this kind of ideology? So this is a long process, no doubt about it, but I think the literature has done quite a lot to look at the end of the process, to look at political violence as an action. And we now need to go back and to try to see if we can mitigate, if we can be involved in earlier stages, especially with youth. I know this is done quite a lot in Denmark and in Sweden. It's done a bit less in the UK, and this is something we should all be engaged in, to look at earlier stages of the process. Um, we know quite a lot about low self-control and its contribution to violence. I think this connection between morality of self-control and extremism is, is kind of new, at least uh, empirically. We should encourage looking at morality as part of the process. This can't only be self-control or personal traits that doesn't have to do with morality. Um, I think this enforces the idea that was written the discuss of political violence and political extremism as moral, as a moral action. We tend to look at political violence as being very different than normal crime, so being a different choice based on ideology, but there's many kinds of crime that are very similar. If we look at political violence as a moral action, I'm jumping to the next point over here, I think that gives us a theoretical framework that we can work in to differentiate between population, that we can work um, to understand different, very different forms of deviant behavior. So I think this gives us an idea of, of the, the, the ways that is not limited to very specific and classic crimes. We can actually use it to look at different forms of human behavior, different moral actions, uh, in a very general way that could allow us to go back and understand the process from the beginning. And I hope the next two talks are gonna do something similar. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> okay, so my name is Jenny Barton Crosby and I'm also based at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge and I also work um, within the SAT framework on the PADS study. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, anger and intimate partner violence. So um, a lot of um, research has um, taken place looking at the relationship between anger and hostility and the perpetration of intimate partner violence, or IPV. 
and a recent meta-analysis by Berkeley and Eckhart has found that there's a moderate association between anger, hostility and IPV perpetration. However, despite this moderate um, association, it's widely acknowledged that anger doesn't always lead to violence, um, violence isn't always preceded by anger, and likewise people who are prone to anger aren't angry and violent in all situations. And so this suggests that there's something else going on. Some other variables um, that may link and help to, um, us to explain this relationship between anger and violence. And so within this presentation, I'm going to be looking at the relationship between anger, morality, and um, acts of intimate partner violence. And I'm going to be using the um, theoretical framework of SAT. So situational action theory defines acts of crime as being moral actions. So what we mean by moral actions is actions that are guided by moral rules. And moral rules are rules of conduct guiding our behaviour. They tell us what is right or wrong to do in a particular situation. Now, moral rules can be informal rules, such as rules of etiquette, um, for example, rules about queuing, um, not talking in a library, or they can be formal rules, such as rules of law. And so, essentially, an act of crime can be quite simply understood as an act that breaks a formal rule. And so how does this characterization of intimate um, characterization of crime as moral action translate to intimate partner violence? Um, so traditionally, intimate partner violence has been considered a private issue rather than being a public and criminal law issue. However, in a number of jurisdictions, there has been a move towards criminalizing intimate partner violence. And so it's now quite widely accepted as being an issue for the criminal law. And so we can see that intimate partner violence is moving increasingly towards becoming recognized as a type of formal um, rule breaking. And so it follows that as a type of rule breaking, intimate partner violence can and should be explained within um, the SAT framework. And so this um, may be familiar to all of you, um, but I'm just going to quickly go over some of the key ideas behind SAT. So SAT is a theory of action. So SAT tries to explain what moves a person to break rules. And the key thing here for SAT is that we need to understand, first of all, the individual characteristics, but also the features of the setting in which the action takes place. We need to understand how these individual level features interact with the features of the setting to result in action. And in this case, we're talking about crime, and in this particular presentation, um, intimate partner violence. With this in mind, um, for this presentation, I am focusing purely on the person and the individual level characteristics. However, it is worth bearing in mind that the full explanation does take or needs to take account of both the person um, and the setting. And so if we just take a look at the individual level characteristics that are relevant um, to this presentation and um, for SAT. So as you're probably all aware, for SAT, the key individual level um, variable is morality. And what SAT means by morality is personal moral rules and moral emotions. Now, personal moral rules are your personal rules about how wrong it is or not wrong to break um, rules of conduct. So how wrong you think it is to hit a partner would be your moral rules regarding IPV. When we talk about moral emotions in SAT, we talk about guilt and shame. And your anticipated guilt, your anticipated shame at breaking the rules is said to influence the strength of your morality. And so it's moral rules and moral emotions together combined um, that create um, this idea of morality in SAT. And the reason that morality is so important in SAT is that it guides our perception of whether rule breaking is an option or not. So if you have a strong morality, you think it's wrong, you care very much about following the rules, you're said to have a strong morality. And if you have a strong morality, you're unlikely to see rule breaking as an option. So if you think it's wrong to hit a partner, you feel very strongly about this, you're unlikely to see that as an option in the first place. On the other hand, if you have a weak morality, you're much more likely to see the rule breaking as an option. However, before morality becomes relevant, we need to understand how people become motivated. And um, this happens before um, morality in the perception process. And so in SAT, motivation is important because this helps us to understand how this explanatory process begins. And in this presentation, I'm going to be looking at the motivational force of anger. And in SAT, when we talk about anger, the key individual level characteristic is our friction sensitivity. And 
Friction sensitivity can simply be understood as our tendency towards anger, our tendency to feel anger in response to frictions within the setting. So um, it may be a friction could be um, a partner lying to you, a partner not doing something they said they would do. It can be any level of friction. Um, but our friction sensitivity influences our reaction, our tendency towards anger. Um, and so we need this motivational force to instigate the process. However, how we respond to this anger is ultimately determined by our morality, because our morality um, influences our perception of our options in response um, to motivation. And it's this interaction between anger and morality that I'm going to be looking at um, in the rest of this presentation. Um, so like many of the um, presentations today um, and yesterday, I'm going to be using data from the PADS study. Um, PADS is a study designed to test the key suppositions of SAT. It's a longitudinal study of representative sample of young people, both males and females, in the UK. And I'm going to be using data from wave eight um, of uh, the study, um, when the participants were around 24 to 25 years of age, um, which um, corresponds with the, the age that um, IPV is thought to um, peak. And the data I'm going to be looking at comes from our questionnaire. So how did we capture um, perpetration of intimate partner violence? So this slide here just illustrates um, some questions that we use that are adapted from the conflict tactics scale um, developed by Strauss and colleagues, which is a widely used um, scale in the IPV literature. Um, you will notice that within um, this um, slide, we only focus on physical violence, but we do ask about um, verbal um, aggression as well. And we do ask about victimization. But within this presentation, we're just focusing on perpetration. So we just asked um, all the participants who had a partner in the last year, which was uh, 541 participants, to answer how often in the last year had they perpetrated any of these acts towards a partner. Now, to create um, a frequency, we followed um, the procedure used by Strauss and colleagues, and that's to take the midpoint of each of these categories. So for each of these items, um, a participant had a frequency, and then the frequencies were summed so that each participant had an overall frequency of perpetration in the last year. So how does um, this data look? So out of the uh, 541, um, only one, um, 81 uh, participants had a prevalence, so 80, only 81 participants reported having um, perpetrated at least one of these um, acts of violence against a partner in the last year. Um, and while in SAT we um, tend to think of sex and gender as a marker rather than a cause, because differences or similarities in men and women in the RPV literature is such um, a big topic, I am just going to illustrate um, some differences here. So of the 81 participants who had a prevalence, 54 uh, were female and 27 were male. Um, and here I've just graphed the um, frequency for those participants with a prevalence. Um, and so we can see that actually it's really quite skewed. So those people who have hit a partner in the last year, most of those have a very low frequency. The majority of participants report between one to five times um, in the last year. Then as we get through to the um, much higher frequencies, we have far fewer people. Um, and you'll also see that the blue um, participants there, the male and the green are the female. And you will see actually the high frequency participants um, are females only. So next, how did we measure this idea of friction sensitivity? So this scale um, illustrates the items we asked um, participants um, about their tendency towards um, getting angry with partners. So we asked, how angry would you be if? And then we asked participants to indicate um, from not at all angry through to very angry. And the scores on this um, scale were summed um, to create an overall sensitivity score. And a high score corresponds to high friction sensitivity. So if you have a high score and you have a high friction sensitivity, it means you have a high tendency towards um, being angry towards um, a partner. Um, and this is just an um, illustration of the distribution. So we can see here that it's roughly normally distributed. Most people are in the medium level of friction sensitivity. So most people respond that they would get a bit angry towards um, a partner if they experience frictions in the setting. Far fewer people in the high and far fewer people um, in the low group. And so now if we have a look at how friction sensitivity relates um, to the frequency of intimate partner violence perpetration, um, here we can see that there's a positive and statistically significant correlation. So as your friction sensitivity increases, so does um, the mean frequency of intimate partner violence. So 
Again, if we have a look just at the males and females, we can see that when we have a look at the males for the correlation, it's not significant. Um, this weak correlation that we find seems to be driven um, by our female participants. So we can see that the females in the high um, sensitivity um, group have a far, far higher average frequency of intimate partner violence than um, their male counterparts. So next we get on to morality. So you'll remember that I mentioned that morality is a composite of your moral rules and your moral emotions. And um, this slide just illustrates some of the um, questions that we integrated into our general morality um, scale. Um, and these target specifically how wrong people think it is to hit a partner in response to frictions. And we have the response options here of very wrong through to not wrong at all. Um, and for these, um, a high score corresponds to a weak morality. So um, people with a high score, it indicates that they don't think it's particularly wrong to hit a partner. And we can see the distribution here. Um, so it's skewed towards most people thinking it is wrong to hit a partner. Um, and as we go through down to the uh, weak morality participants, we have far fewer people who don't think it's particularly wrong to hit a partner um, at all. And likewise, with moral emotions, we ask people specifically, how ashamed would you feel, how guilty would you feel if you hit um, a partner? Um, and again, we have some response options here from not at all to um, very much. And again, the scores here are summed, so a high score corresponds to weak moral emotion. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the distribution um, mirrors that of the moral rules. So again, most people indicate that they have strong moral emotions. So they would feel guilty, they would feel ashamed if they hit a partner. And again, as we get through to the weak moral emotions, far fewer people um, have these uh, weak scores. And to get this composite of um, intimate partner violence morality, um, the, the scores on the moral rules and the moral emotion scales were converted to Z scores and um, added together. So each person has an IPV specific morality um, score. And again, when we look at how intimate partner violence morality relates to your frequency of um, perpetration, again, we have this positive correlation. So as our um, morality becomes weaker, um, we have a higher frequency of intimate partner violence perpetration. So we can see if we look at the people with a strong morality, there's um, a mean um, frequency of less than one, whereas those with the weak morality have a mean frequency of uh, 3.52. Again, this is reflected again when we look at males and females. This time the males are still um, statistically significant. So for both males and females, as their morality becomes weaker, there is a higher um, tendency towards um, committing more acts of intimate partner violence. So, so far what we've looked at is just how intimate partner violence um, relates broadly to friction sensitivity and morality. So now in the last part of the um, presentation, I'm just going to go through how we can use um, friction sensitivity and morality to predict partner violence and also have a look at this interaction between friction sensitivity and morality. <clears throat> So this um, slide here just illustrates um, a simple linear regression where we look at um, intimate partner violence, morality, and friction sensitivity, and I've also included sex or gender because we have seen um, these disparities between males and females. But we see in this model that it's only intimate partner violence that is a significant predictor of um, frequency of intimate partner violence. So as your morality becomes weaker, you have this higher tendency towards um, intimate partner violence perpetration. All the other variables aren't significantly um, predicting frequency of violence. However, when we have a look at the interaction, so when we have a look at when partner um, violence morality interacts with friction sensitivity, we see that there is an interaction. So this means simply that as your friction sensitivity increases and your morality becomes weaker, there's a higher tendency towards more acts of intimate partner violence. So I think this is illustrated more clearly with this graph. So here I've just dichotomized morality. So we have people with a strong morality and we have people with um, a weak morality. So the weak morality people are those who um, were categorized as medium and weak. And we can see here that the blue line um, are the people with the strong morality. So we can see that these people along the bottom think it's wrong to hit a partner. They would care very much um, about following these rules. And these people with a strong morality are quite resistant um, to the influence of friction sensitivity. So regardless of how angry they tend to get, they're not going to see violence um, as an option because the morality prevents them from seeing it as this option. They think it's wrong. 
But the other hand, people with the weak morality seem to be much more influenced by their friction sensitivity. And we can see here the disparity between when we look at the high friction sensitivity and those people with the weak morality, they're far more likely to see and choose and engage in acts of violence against a partner because they don't think it's particularly wrong to do so. And so that's kind of the main point here is that anger, friction sensitivity may be important, may be a key motivator. However, how we deal and respond to this motivation is ultimately down to our morality, how much we care about following the rules, how much we care about um, abiding by the law, stating that it's wrong to hit a partner. And so kind of the take home message when it comes to implications really is that perhaps interventions, perhaps um, prevention, should really focusing on how we can strengthen people, people's morality, um, we can, how we can strengthen and make people believe and want to follow the law regarding intimate partner violence and understanding and um, believing that it's unacceptable. Um, with that all in mind, I think it's also important to remind you that these are very preliminary findings um, and to remind you that also that I haven't looked at the context in which intimate partner violence um, occurs. So this is just a very partial um, um, explanation and um, investigation. So that's it. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? We might have some time at the end as well if anyone. Um... Hello. Um, right, so unlike Gally and Jenny, Mine is more of a theoretical piece. I don't have any data associated with this presentation. But essentially, the presentation is to question the current conceptualization of psychopathy and really ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish with the disorder? And I'll draw on the essay on situational action theory and how it under, comes to understand the causes of behaviors. But before I start, I've put a definition of psychopathy on the board, on the slides. And essentially, it's a personality disorder distinguished by callous disregards for the feelings of others, egocentricity, and impulsive social rule breaking. Uh, there's no real golden definition of, of what psychopathy actually is currently, but I'd say most people would agree that these components are probably uh, quite current and quite relevant to the, the disorder. And some of the symptoms of psychopathic personality disorder include grandiose, arrogant, callous, superficial, Manipulative, short-tempered, unable to form strong emotional bonds, lack of guilt, lack of anxiety, irresponsible, and impulsive. Now, when I read these symptoms out, there's kind of a red flag that, that comes in my head, and I really do question whether all these symptoms that I've just named are characteristic of one naturally forming personality disorder. And maybe I start to question whether we're, we're trying to do too many things under one disorder and maybe we're trying to, to cram it in into to something that doesn't necessarily fit together. And what I'm trying to get to is, I think we're seeing less psychopathy these days as a personality disorder. And we're kind of, we've moved away from that and really s seeing it more as an explanation or a reason why people um, behave deviantly or act deviantly. And in other words, we're, we're using it as a general theory of deviance in, in a way. But essentially, before I go through that, I think it's quite important to go through the historical kind of aspect. I'll go through a brief one, and really how I think deviance has come to be integrated within the disorder. I'll just expand on that point on why I see it more as a general theory of deviance, less than a personality disorder these days. And then three and four of those points, it's more of the consequences of seeing the psychopathy in those ways. And, and number five, it's just the next steps forward, and I think the next needed steps to kind of progress the disorder into more realistic light. So essentially, one of the first researchers to actually research psychopathy was Pinel, who was a French physician, and he noted that some of his physicians acted impulsively and self-inflicted damage upon themselves, but with no real signs of delusions or psychosis, and at this point, psychopathy was not really associated as a personality disorder, 
or even seen as deviant. It was just seen as a mental illness that affected individuals' moral reasonings and emotionality. But then in 1930s, uh, sorry, 1830s, Pritchard comes along and really argues this fact, and, and he really tries to associate psychopathy as a deficit in character or a deficit in personality. And their consistent lack in moral reasoning, he said, deserved to be punished or socially condemned. And also this kind of also widened the scope of the disorder to really include anything that was socially unacceptable behavior. And at this point, I think the label really took almost all things considered mental health at that time, except for schizophrenia and intellectual disabilities. Now, at the end of the 1800s, it's kind of a German school of thought that arises, and it was a, a huge emphasis on behavior. And that German school of thought was quite skeptic on really measuring affective, well, the accuracy of, actually, of measuring affective and moral beliefs in order to identify psychopathic individuals. And they did argue that every mental illness really has a physical expression. And, and in order to, to actually accurately diagnose psych psychopathy, you would just need to view those physical expressions and, in other words, just measure the behaviors. And this, really emphasize, this emphasis on behavior really pushed aside this relationship between psychopathy and really viewing it as a moral or emotional deficit. And like Pritchard in the 1830, in 1830s, it really over-incorporated many aspects that were kind of seen as unwanted. So stress, anxiety, depression, suicide were really kind of grouped under this label. But in the 1900, you really see kind of the evolution and really start to see psychopathy um, more into what we know of as today. And Kraplan was a huge part of that. And although he kind of agreed with the German school of thought that this emphasis on behavior was needed to measure this, of, to measure psychopathy, he did criticize kind of this over-incorporating aspect and, and kind of viewing everything as psychopathy. So he really tried to narrow down the classification, but in, or, in order to do so, he really just included the most devastating and the most frequent behaviors viewed by physicians. And really, I think because of this, and, and this is really a turning point in, in psychopathy, is at this point, I think it's, we've started to, to view psychopathy as more of an explanation uh, for why people behave deviantly or, or a reason like as a cause for why certain people would you know, see deviant acts as okay to do. And um, he also advocated in his own words that you know, psycho, psychopathic, well, psychopathic individuals are born criminals or um, enemies of society. Now, in the 1940s, really, you do see kind of a, a trend a bit more towards this emphasis on uh, affective and moral reasoning by Cleckley, but this aspect of deviancy still lingered on, so you kind of had these two worlds uh, characteristics um, kind of characterizing psychopathy. And based off Cleckley's work in the 1870s, but got popular in the 18, uh, 1980s, Hare really develops the psychopathic checklist. Now, some of you might be familiar with that, it's probably the most used clinically wise, the most used measure uh, for psychopathy. Uh, and this also incorporated Cleckley's work where you do have this emotional affective aspect of it, but like in the 1900s really, this aspect of deviancy still lingered on. And what I'm trying to go get at is we, really need to know what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that's a very important question we need to ask ourselves at this point. And it, it, it's unclear whether we are still trying to understand the underlying problems of an affective and cognitive personality disorder, or really using this evolved concept with the aspect of deviancy in order to explain why people uh, behave deviantly. And the way I see it is psycho psychopathic personality disorder is trying to multitask right now. And we're trying to do too many things, or two things, under one disorder. And by incorporating these two aims into one single disorder, you're essentially bringing two aims worth of symptoms into a cluster and categorizing it into one, one concept. And by attempting to use psychopathy as an explanation for severe deviancy, I think by default, really, this, this does just 
kind of shift and, and shift our mindset on what is actually important. Now, I also think it stigmatizes the, the disorder and by solely using a personality disorder to explain deviancy, we are suggesting that their personalities is the source for deviancy or in other words, a really simplistic way of looking at it is they do terrible things because they are terrible people and this attempt to explain deviancy through a, a, just a personality disorder leads, to, leads us to believe that they're born criminal or inherently evil and I think it does kind of move us away from really understanding the real underlying problems of the disorder and also it, it stigmatizes the disorder in order to yeah, uh, to view these individuals as difficult to deal with, difficult to manage, and really nearly impossible to treat. And I think it's a, by just categorizing a personality disorder as a cause or as a way to explain deviancy, it's a very simplistic way of, of looking at something that's actually quite complex. And in the process, we are assuming a lot. So I think, I think personally, I think we need to start viewing behaviors as a situational construct and Situational action theory is, is really helpful in understanding the cause of behaviors and it does stress that um, the behaviors are situational factors rather than purely based off personality. And people don't act in a social vacuum. Uh, depending on your immediate environment, you will, you will act differently. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. And I mean, just a silly example, you guys are all sitting down, um, but would you necessarily be sitting down in the middle of a dance floor when everybody else is dancing? And, it's, it's a stupid example, but it just goes to show that behaviors aren't consistent across settings. So to really fully understand why people behave deviantly or people behave in general, you really need to take in consideration the circumstances and really basing behaviors through uh, an explanation of personality features, I don't think is enough. And I think there's a bigger picture out there. And although I, I am criticizing this overemphasis on personality, I'm also not saying it's, it's not relevant. And for example, kind of like Jenny said, violence is often viewed as a correlate of anger, but I'm sure many people in this room would probably never resort to violence, no matter how angry you guys would get. So essentially, in a nutshell, deviant behavior is a result of certain kinds of people in certain kinds of places, and not necessarily based off of an inherently bad personality. So I'd like to say that Yes, psychopathic personality disorder is related to deviance in a certain way, and there's something going on there. It's, I think it's really needed, it's important, and I think it's, it's really fun to, fun might not be the right word, but interesting to, to find out. And however, what I'm trying to say is, I don't think it's a direct influencer, and psychopathy should be more viewed as an influencer of individuals' morality, which then will in turn will affect how someone perceives the world around them. And I think that's a better, accurate way of viewing psychopathy. And, and what I really love about this situational perspective and kind of moving away from, from this aspect of, of viewing um, a deviant as a result of personality, which you often see in the psycho, uh, psychopathy literature, um, the situational perspective really does move away from the stigmatization of individuals. And what I'm... What I think is the next step forward, I think we need to start viewing psychopathy as an influencer of how people view the world and how people construct themselves, depending on the setting, and not as a direct influencer. I think that needs to be stressed. And I think this shift in mindset would remove the idea that psychopathy can be used as an explanation for deviance and remove a large part of the stigmatization that psychopathy is associated with terrible acts. What I'm saying is psychopathy doesn't go hand in hand with deviancy and, and understanding how psychopathic personality disorder influences, I think, pe how people perceive the world and in other words, as SAT puts it, their, their morality, um, I think should be the main objective. And in other words, what are the natural occurring maladaptive, cognitive and affective features making up psychopathy? And, and I think we really need to steer away from really including deviant behavior in the definition of psychopathy as really they're not exclusively explained by personality. So the real next step is, I think, is developing a new conceptualization removed from diagnosing psychopathic personality disorder based off deviant behavior 
and also removed from trying to use it as an explanation for deviance. And I think there needs to be a switch from mentally viewing psychopathy as a direct influencer of behaviors into an influencer of morality, which focuses on cognitive and affective personality features. So, bearing that in mind, I've been working on a conceptualization now. It's, it's a huge work in progress and it's nowhere to be done. But I think the main point I wanna take away from this is I think we need to start moving away from this aspect of impulsivity into the concept. And I, I see impulsivity, like I see other behaviors, as not an outcome purely on personality. And it's more, I think it should be seen more as a, a situational um, construct. But also, I think it's also been integrated in the uh, concept as more of an explanation for why people commit deviance. And I do question whether it does naturally occur with these cognitive and affective features naturally in individuals. So I think that's the main part I want to get at. Now, I think it might seem counterintuitive to move away from deviant behavior in criminal justice because I guess that's the most important part of psychopathy is really understanding why people behave deviantly or do criminal acts. And moving away from it might not seem that interesting. But if we kind of deconstruct psychopathy, and, and really, as, as I see it now, it's, it's an umbrella term. And if we can just take out the important parts of it and really apply it to situational action theory, we don't need the personality disorder to explain deviancy. We just need it to explain a personality disorder, and then we can apply relevant aspects of that to situational action theory and how we start to understand behaviors. Now, this, some of you might be familiar with this, this is how situational action theory views uh, in a personality way the kind of um, development of morality and then pro crime propensity and then that turns into criminal behavior. Don't disregard the colors right now, but that's just kind of a, a framework of, of SAT. Now, if we add on what we currently think of psychopathy, you see this aspect of negative affect, self-centeredness, deviancy, and impulsivity. It's quite, there's a lot of overlap right now, but what I think is, this is, this is the problem with, with psychopathy, is it's trying to do too many things, and we don't really know if it is more of an explanation for deviancy or predictive deviancy. Or are we really still trying to understand a personality disorder? And uh, what I'm trying to get at is, I don't necessarily think all these links in red, which I've kind of um, distinguished as current conceptualization of psychopathy, actually are linked naturally. What I think might be a better option is if we move away from just over-incorporating everything and really focus on personality disorder. Because we, we know there's something going on. There, there, is, there is something leading these individuals to deviancy. Um, but I think it's more an emphasis on this lack of negative affect and self-centeredness, which in turn might develop the morale, like how people see and perceive the world. That's kind of what I'm getting at. And also how people's um, moral rules of conduct, so what they think is right or wrong to do. And I think a personality disorder, an accurate personality disorder, I think that seems a bit more natural and I could, I could maybe, this is, this is what I wanna try as well and I'd like to maybe get your feedback if you guys have um, any opinions on this. Uh, I'd like to test this out, but I don't necessarily think that all these elements that are currently in, in psychopathy are um, naturally occurring. And that's kind of what I want to get at. And what I really think a personality disorder is, is this lack of negative affect and self-centeredness. Um, but that's, that's it for now. But like I said, it's a work in progress. But if you guys do have any questions or comments or things, I'd really like to, to hear your opinions, but that's, Yes, that's it.
Any questions? Yep. Oh. Thank you. So my question is, I think it's really interesting that you want to place this in the context or in the situation. And the obvious question is, how would we do that? Because the only thing that I'm thinking of in terms of how to actually capture that information is scenarios. Mm -hmm. Is that what you would have in mind or do you have other ideas that can be used to tackle that? So when you're saying, are you, in, are you saying to measure behaviors? Is that or? Well, you are discussing measuring this whole self-centeredness and so on, but then mm -hmm. merging it somehow with the situation, giving the example of how we would not sit on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you do want to measure it in context, then obviously maybe it differs by context. Yes. Or what's appropriate in one context is not appropriate in another. Mm -hmm. But then how do you get the information? It's a very good question. So then, so then I was thinking, how, how can we do it? And the only method that I could come up with now was use scenarios and ask people, how, how do you think you should behave in, in this situation or something mm -hmm. like that? But maybe you have other... No, I think I'm still working on that aspect as well. And scenarios might be a way to do it. Um, what I was going to do is just use kind of what pads had and really view morality in the form of a questionnaire, but if you're looking at certain aspects of deviant behavior, or um, I think PADS have used it for, for violence, it might be a, an option to, to maybe see those different situations. It's a, it's a good point, yeah. Thanks. Thank you.